Hello my dear friends, how is it going? I'm Ari Therger and today I'm going to answer a question posed by one of my patrons a long time ago and I've made the reply at that time of course uh, but I thought perhaps this would be interesting to bring into this channel as well and share it with all of you. The question was what is a solar deity? <laughs> well, I don't know, I don't claim to know, I don't make the rules, but I'll share a couple of words uh, with you on the matter. Uh, so let's get right into it, shall we? Uh, uh, and um, I may ramble a little bit today, as I'm only here today to have a conversation with you. Uh, but, and please, by all means, share in the comments your thoughts and examples and experiences Sadly, I'm sorry, I, I may not have the time to reply to all of you, uh, but I do the effort to read your comments, as many as possible. Well now, um, since I'm short on time due to the extensive amount of work I have to do in this suffocating society, let's delve into this subject and see what comes out of this today. Please, what exactly is the criteria to be or to become a solar deity? There are a few categories we must have in mind. Gender, climate, economy, culture and religion. It is a general thought that the sun is male and the moon is female, as many neo-pagans have stated for quite some time, which isn't at all true. This varies from culture to culture, obviously, and the specific gender attributes each culture throughout the history of humankind gave to an anthropomorphization of the sun. If the society is more patriarchal, it's only natural, or perhaps it is more... Or th there is a predisposition to attribute to certain prominent deities traits and characteristics that that same society understands to be representative of the male figure. So a deity with more relevance in such a society will be male, most likely, as the representation of the elite who controls the religious sphere, and so it reinforces its power through the deity that is considered to be the most powerful, becoming less of a deity and more of a representation of the human group who controls the society. I think a good example of that is uh, Sol Invictus, which has probably crossed your mind, as the male sun god of the later Roman Empire which is an extended religious conception of the cult of the emperor. Of course, the, the same can, can be said concerning societies who are either more matriarchal in, the, in their structure of governance or if they see specific attributes of nature or in nature as manifestations of the reproductive feminine powers. And so many prominent deities become feminine, especially in an agrarian context when the sun is an important factor in the economy and livelihood of certain societies. And so a sun goddess is represented with specific feminine attributes, or indeed with clear iconographic or stylized representations of the feminine reproductive system, such is the case, for instance, uh, I've talked about on another video, which you can see right here, uh, concerning the prehistoric Iberian solar goddess. If a certain society had no specific stipulated gender roles, a solar deity can be either male or female, or no gender, gender attribution at all. So, gender attribution to deities is a reflection of the perceptions of gender of a given society. Some societies throughout history have more or less concrete definitions of gender and each gender role within society and attributed activities to specific notions of gender. And so this will be reflected on the conception of the divine of such societies. Other societies demonstrate a, a lot more gender fluidity, which is often found within animistic societies. And they usually extend gender definitions to more than two based on both the acceptance of gender identification and the gender fluidity of some members of, of their societies. And so this is also reflected in some of their gods, who are neither male nor female, sometimes hermaphroditic deities, 
sometimes no gender at all is attributed, which, from the part of a modern westernized point of view, such deities sometimes are then attributed a specific gender, not because it is understood as such by the very animistic societies where these gods are present in their magical religious panorama, but because um, modern Western social thinking attributes gender to certain deities based on their attributes and associations according to the preconceived gender identity or identities uh, or gender identity conceptions of the Western society, right? I'm speaking in general terms, of course. It's just a conversation. <laughs> um, the moon as a male god is already perceptible in many or a few Mesolithic societies, patriarchal societies, uh, whose first calendars were based on the moon cycles and not the sun cycles. Prehistoric societies before the Neolithic worshipped the moon more often than the sun. The sun was, let's say, hardly needed and had little positive influence in prehistoric societies before the agricultural revolution. If the moon was understood as male, then the sun was female, as an opposite. Mesolithic moon calendars controlled by the patriarchal elite, so the moon becomes male, while the sun plays other roles in these societies, such as an idea of emanating light, understood as a giver of light. And so the sun is understood as female, and as a, as a giver of life. This Mesolithic belief was kept in many societies uh, throughout the ages, especially the ones who had little influence from societies whose sun god was male. Uh, for instance, in Scandinavia, the sun remained female and the moon was male, uh, because there was little religious influence from the Roman culture, late Roman culture, who worshipped the sun in the figure of the, the emperor. Um, and the Sol Invictus, uh, previously said, who officially became the sun god of the later Roman Empire and a patron of soldiers. But we shall get to Northern Europe, uh, Northern Europe uh, further ahead, which is a, an interesting example. I think one of the great factors, n not the most important, but one of the great factors that affects the mythology of each culture is the economy. Economy affects the political thinking, which in turn influences religions and subsequently the perceptions of the divine sphere. For instance, before the Neolithic, as previously said, there was little need for the sun, uh, not just because there was no agriculture in a massive scale at least, not yet, but because for millions or at least for thousands of hundreds of thousands of years uh, the human being was nomadic and it would be less dangerous to move during the night to avoid the human's uh, most powerful and dangerous predator other human beings mankind guided their lives through the moon the phases of the moon or the the, the moon cycles which is why later on during the neolithic in great megalithic uh, structures uh, reflects uh, outstanding knowledge of the um, equinoxes, solstices, and astrology to a certain extent, and why many myths are the representations of astronomical phenomenon and representations of stars, constellations, again to a certain extent, and uh, other cosmic events, surely, mo mostly in relation to the weather and the seasons and, and the cycles of the sun and the moon. Uh, mankind didn't develop this outstanding knowledge in the Neolithic alone. Uh, megalithic structures are the result of millions or, again, hundreds of thousands of years of observing the night sky. And equinoxes, solstices, the, the moon cycles, as evidenced by early spiral motifs with concavities at their center to measure the changing of the seasons and the yearly turning points of the seasons. Such spiral motifs engraved on rock as the earliest known systems that assist or have assisted in the observation of equinoxes and solstices and so on and so forth. As I've pointed out on the video concerning the Troyabo um, labyrinth, but in relation to the earliest known spiral and uh, labyrinth motifs in Western Iberian Atlantic. Matriarchal or patriarchal societies, the moon was of great relevance in the life of almost every society before the agricultural revolution, as I said before. Uh, but indeed, 
it also very much depends on the economy. Because if we take a look at, as an example, pre-Islamic cultures, right, mostly northern uh, Arabian Peninsula, especially concerning the periods that coincide with the European Chalcolithic and Bronze Age periods, a deity representative of the sun would usually be understood as male, while a deity representative of the moon would be understood as female. And this has to do with metallurgy and the types of metals worked to create jewelry for the members of the elite and high social classes. Silver jewelry was mostly used by women, and since it resembled or, or reflected the, the silver light of the moon, the moon would be considered female, while, the, while gold was mostly used by men, as it reflected the golden light of the sun, so the sun would be considered male. Again, gender attribution to gods in general very much depends on gender perceptions of societies, which doesn't make gods male or female in nature, in essence. It just shows a reflection of human behavior, social roles, and the importance of certain materials in the economy of societies. But, in general terms, again, everything changed in the Neolithic. Um, societies progressively became less nomadic and more sedentary. Agriculture was the main source of sustenance, and therefore the entire economy revolved around agriculture, which means the most precious and <coughs> sorry, the most precious and the highly valuable goods was the final product uh, resulting from the agricultural activities. The sun was much needed, praised, worshipped even. During the late Neolithic, metals started to be introduced in the economy mostly copper and gold, be beaten raw, still beaten raw. These metals were not used for tools, obviously, not even weapons, too fragile to be in any sort of warlike activity or directly part of actions that require the use of force, brute force. But bright as they were, reflecting the colors of the sun, copper and gold, in this case, reflecting fire even in the case of copper, uh, these metals were used for all sorts of ornamentation of the higher social classes and, of course, the elite who controls the religion. These metals were uh, reminiscent of the sun, uh, the natural cosmic phenomenon, phenomenon much needed uh, to boost the economy. Without sun, little could be cultivated. <laughs> During the Neolithic, there is a great flourishment of solar deities, both female and male, very much depending on the local elites and who controlled the religious sphere. During the Chalcolithic, Copper Age, solar deities stand above all the other gods in the various pantheons of each culture. Some cultures even demonstrate the first stages or vestiges of monotheistic religious thinking, entire societies developing their religions around the figure of a solar deity, be that male or female. During the Chalcolithic, much of the megalithic structures of the previous era were either broke down, torn apart, or, or reshaped to fit the new religious reality of the supreme solar deities. Bright metals such as copper and gold reflected the entire religiosity of cultures. These metals became the symbols of sophistication, technological advancements, superiority even, and the, the symbol of the local elites mostly chieftains, which during the Bronze Age became the economic, religious, political and military leaders. The, the working of metals became the new booster of the economy, especially in terms of war, uh, creation of weaponry, and so we see the emergence of gods associated with war, of course, and war gods that are also solar gods personifying the religious, military, and economic power of the elites. Metals were more valuable at this time than agricultural products. During the Bronze Age, metals were everything. In fact, it's very well present in the archaeological record, at least during the Western European Chalcolithic and Bronze Age. 
and a, 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 a progressive abandonment of settlements in low relief areas and people start to build fortified settlements in the hills and on other higher geographical prominent landscape features which will extend until the Iron Age as a response to the protection of agricultural products and the superfluous percentage of the production or the super abundant uh, commodity of the local economy, protecting it against invasive populations. After the intensive and extensive agricultural production, a great climate of hostility is generated uh, by several populations that attack uh, other populations to steal their agricultural products. So in the late Chalcolithic, until the Iron Age, there is an intentional construction of hill forts and, and fortified set settlements and hunting began or, or was intensified as a means of subsistence because it was not possible to farm since it was very dangerous to inhabit areas of low relief. So here in these periods, many more male deities began to appear that reflected the warlike character of the elites that ruled the fortified settlements. And the sun and the moon no longer have as much weight as before in these types of societies, but continue to have a great weight and a great importance in societies that continue to farm, whose main subsistence or system of subsistence continues to be agriculture. These societies became more warlike, not only forced to defend their properties and their goods, uh, because it was in, in, the, in the great cities, fortified cities and towns, that all the final products of the economic system was kept, and thus outsiders wanted to sack cities to obtain the goods. But these societies were also forced to become more warlike, to counterattack, gain more lands, and expand their economy, therefore enhancing the wealth of the elite. Solar gods changed from fertility deities, healing deities, even supreme deities of the sky, givers of light, life and blessings upon all living creatures, and were turned into ruthless war gods, blessing the elite, exercising their divine powers through the mortal chieftain, who was now the reflection of the solar deities on earth, the embodiment of the solar gods. These societies were highly patriarchal, so their solar deities were male, obviously. The Bronze Age, and perhaps most especially the Iron Age, saw a great development of patriarchal societies whose solar deities were the reflection of the elites, patriarchal warrior deities. But in the case of Scandinavia, as I said before, things were a little bit different. As an interesting example, uh, the idea that Scandinavia was very isolated from the rest of the world isn't true at all. However, certain cultural developments indeed were not widely widespread in Scandinavia uh, in, in a homogeneous sense, right? So in certain periods of history, in certain regions of Scandinavia, well, it took a little bit longer to enter in certain periods of major changes. Not because they did not have contact with other civilizations, but mostly because of climate and geography. In the sense that uh, it was much more difficult to move around in northern parts of the, of the Scandinavian peninsula. So most people were actually concentrated or, or centered in the south of the peninsula and had more contact with several civilizations, adopting, altering, adding several cultural factors, creating rich systems of belief, which were also added to systems of belief of populations further north. And so in terms of deities, there's a lot, of, a lot more associations with different things according to the level of importance of a given deity and how far the conception of that same deity would reach, further adding even more attributes and even changing the character of the deity. Much of Scandinavia was still in the Mesolithic and the Neolithic in the south, while the rest of Western Europe was getting out of the Bronze Age. Only 
southern Scandinavia had more contact with, let's say, the outside world. Uh, the southern Scandinavian Bronze Age, especially western Scandinavia, and perhaps most especially what is now western Norway, marks an intensive maritime activity, and Scandinavians in their Bronze Age environment went far and wide, having contact with several Western Atlantic civilizations, from the British Isles to the Iberian Peninsula, quite intensive actually, and even contact with Greeks to the, to the far east of the Mediterranean, which is a period that Bronze Age sadly doesn't get a lot of attention because in terms of Scandinavian pre-Christian history most of us will focus a lot more on the Viking period and it seems that Scandinavians only got out of their cocoon <laughs> by this period, by the, the Viking period. But in fact on an earlier period, the, the Bronze Age, it marked an intensive maritime trading network with several civilizations. Well, <laughs> this to say that Western and Southern Scandinavia shows clear Bronze Age rock engravings of solar gods, warrior male gods, as a result with the intensive contact with other civilizations and, and, and the warrior gods connected to the sun and the, the expression of the warrior elite. But it's during the migration period, mostly during the Iron Age, Scandinavian Iron Age, uh, that uh, Scandinavian, Scandinavia adopts, uh, for instance, the Germanic god Tiwas as their warrior deity, a solar god. It's possible that before Tiwas, known in Scandinavia as Tuir, of course, uh, the sun deity had been female before, uh, keeping some possible forgotten matriarchal cult of the Mesolithic and early Neolithic. Sol, or Sunna, was kept in the myths as the goddess of the sun, reflecting a more perhaps a more ancient past in the Scandinavian cultures and religions. But Tuir had already been a sun god of old German Iron Age continental context and was kept as a sun god. But due to Christianity, his role was put aside and his son, Balder, this is still debatable, was transformed to resemble the figure of Jesus. Balder is clearly a sun deity uh, which is why most likely he was the son of Tuir, as I've previously said on other videos. But cr Christianization in Scandinavia altered many aspects of Norse myths and in general Nordic myths of the Viking period or Viking Age, let alone the, the Iron Age myths and myths of previous prehistoric eras. So a, a great confusion was created and Baldr became the son of Odin who was now seen as the equivalent of the supreme divine male force of Christianity. Odin became a reflection of the Christian God. Bother became Jesus. So it would be only natural that Bother had to be now the son of Odin, just as Jesus was the son of God. But let's not delve into that. Scandinavian Iron Age solar deities seem to have been represented as male figures due to the um, cultural factors absorbed by the elites during the migration period as well. But the, the Norse myths still show examples of sky and solar deities as female from what seems to have been a prehistoric past where matriarchal systems have had a considerable weight on the lives livelihood and the economy of prehistoric Scandinavian peoples, such as the example of the sky goddess Nut, the night, as a goddess of creation, of the sky and of creation, who created the earth and the day. Her son, Dagr, day, daytime, rides across the sky, illuminating everything. So there's a male association to the sun here, or perhaps not the sun, itself, but the illumination of the, the sun is male, or daytime is male, while other myth, myths speak of Sol as a goddess of the sun, and Mani as the male entity of the moon. I've talked about this before, that in the Norse myths we see several myths of creation, and sometimes creation is provided by a male god, sometimes by a goddess, sometimes by a hermaphroditic entity, sometimes by nine cosmic mothers, as it is attested in the source Voluspo. These myths present different cultural realities in Scandinavia. 
not only from different periods, but also from different peoples and exchange of cultures throughout the ages. Sometimes the most important deity of creation pans to the male side, sometimes to the female side, and this is also reflected on the divine conceptions that give us the identity of a solar deity. In Norse myths, sometimes the solar god is male, being Dagr as the male god of daylight or daytime, or Tuir as the solar god of war, or Bother, who ends up reflecting the medieval characteristics of Christ as a solar male god. But sometimes the sun is feminine, as Sol. In Norse myths, the origin of the sun and the moon, in terms of gender assigned to these celestial bodies, is the opposite of other civilizations, such as the um, classical civilizations of the Mediterranean, uh, central and southern Mediterra Mediterranean mostly. In Iceland, the sun is feminine and the moon is masculine, which is also, ref also reflected on other Germanic languages. For example, in German, die Sonne, uh, feminine attribution to the sun, and der Mond, uh, masculine for the moon. So it's really not like uh, as many neo-pagans have been claiming and stating for a long time regarding pre-Christian cults concerning these heavenly bodies that pre-Christian cultures worship the solar masculine and the lunar feminine, which may be true for classical cultures, pre-Christian classical cultures, pagan cultures, and the, of course, Western esoteric tradition, but not for all cultures, including ancient Germanic cultures, for instance. In Norse mythology, we have evidences that the night is feminine and day is masculine, but the sun is feminine and the moon is masculine, which seems to be myths of earlier origins, before male solar gods were added to the myths in the Bronze Age and Iron Age in Scandinavia or in the late Viking Age period, of course, uh, the Christian religious associations between the Son and Christ reflected in the god Baldr. So, what exactly makes a solar deity? The perceptions of the divine sphere are the reflections of the human consciousness. The gods are what we want them to be, and they transform themselves according to the needs of our societies. Solar deities through time reflect the economy, politics, and religion, and military realities of each culture in each period of human history. This doesn't mean the gods do not exist or that we are the ones to create them, not all of them. <laughs> this only means that in our greediness we forgot the true purpose of each deity and we gave them characteristics they didn't have uh, just to fit into our own limited perceptions of the divine, mostly to control the masses in order to enhance the wealth of the elites. The more complex a society gets in its social organization and attribution of activities to people, to human persons, the more conceptions will emerge and overlap each other, and the divine sphere progressively becomes more of a reflection of the human society rather than anything else. And so religion as a tool to control the masses starts, starts to anthropomorphize deities in order to give clear and specific examples, physical examples of representations of humans and their roles within a specific society. So attribution of gender and social roles to deities is a pattern within human society that does not reflect the entities we consider to be divine or we, we often call gods, but in fact it only reflects a human understanding of those entities. An understanding that usually reflects the culture of a human society to better fit it into boxes and labels. Gods with gender attribution to reflect gender roles is part of human culture to provide patterns that facilitated the comprehension of our existence as humans through the experiences, ideas, thoughts, and other human creations that flourish from the perceptive level of humans experiencing life. So, of course, this limits experience itself we have with entities we deem to be divine. 
from the moment we attribute gender, personality, roles, associations to entities of the world, we are giving them a human expression, which becomes part of language, human language, when addressing such entities. And language has a tremendous influence on the perception we have of things. If we understand an entity to be she, he, they, them, or it, we have already created a limitation for that entity that only fits in our own perception of what, const what constitutes gender and according to the culture we grew up in and what that culture defines as characteristics of, of gender. And so this destroys the comprehension of entities who, whose existence is beyond human existence, which is probably why in animism definitions of gender and social roles to deities isn't that well defined and when defined more often than not are definitions based on social perceptions of other civilizations who try to also label and put into boxes animistic entities in order to better understand them according to the pre-established and the stipulated social roles of those civilizations. In animism, the, the focal, focal point isn't to find gender or human social behavior in entities of the world that are not human, but rather to find personhood in the world and identify what is alive and what demonstrates personhood in order to establish relationship with the persons of the world. I don't think it's a, it's a question of attributing gender and other human characteristics and, and certainly not attributing uh, limited conceptions of gender to a person whose entire existence doesn't fit into those limited conceptions. It's just a question of finding personhood and create relationship with that person in an, uh, in an, an animistic worldview. From my understanding of animism, it doesn't seem to be a question of understanding gender or identification of gender, not, not a question of understanding uh, at all how and why a person manifests its own existence, but rather understanding that each person, each entity is built differently and we should respect that and create relationships with persons of the world. In this sense, in an animistic sense still, what makes a solar deity or any deity at all of anything is nothing at all. <laughs> it's simply a human association to an entity that expresses itself in a way that we understand to be attributed to a reality we can immediately put a label on. This will only affect human ability to grasp the experiences it has with certain entities, but won't define those entities. Just the same way we, we do it with human people, with, with human persons. We don't need to understand why humans identify themselves with this or that, or as this or that. I think we just need to understand that each human is built differently, and that's it. And we need to respect that. It all turns out to be how religion, social class, uh, culture, and other factors of society and, and life affect us, but it will never define us. The same can be said for our perception of all sorts of persons, be those human persons, animal persons, other than human persons, and more than human persons. Whatever we may perceive of the others is often a reflection of what the society we live in understands of these others, but it will never define the others. All right, my dear friends, I hope you have enjoyed today's video. A little bit of a rumble today. <laughs> I'm sorry, but today I, I'm a little bit tired. I have lo loads of work to do. <laughs> so I just wanted to talk a little bit for a change and, and not a lecture this time. <laughs> anyway, uh, I hope you have enjoyed today's video. I hope it was useful in, in any way. Please share in the comments your perceptions and your experiences. I will try to read uh, your comments as, as many as possible. Once again, thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. 
And as always, Black Florida, thanks for today. Obrigado por hoje. <laughs> Farewell. Ahem. <clears throat>